Yes, that's me behind the glasses. And I represented South African national cricket team. It's great to be here. But before I begin today's class, I wanted to talk to you about my first classroom. I was born in Peter Maritzburg, South Africa. And I challenge you guys to spell Peter Maritzburg. Yeah, not so easy. But I tell you what, as a, a young South African growing up, outdoor, very active, school was a little bit difficult, but I did have two parents who were both teachers. My mother was a teacher and my father a principal. So from that point of view, I had a really good start um, to my education. It started at home and went through the school day. I didn't exactly have a favorite teacher because I was always a, a student who didn't want to upset anybody. So most of, the, most of the teachers I got on very well with because my dad was, as a principal, very firm on discipline. So with regards to having a favorite teacher, there wasn't anybody other than the physical education teacher who was also my hockey coach that uh, I connected really well with. So as a student, like I said, discipline was a, a really big issue in the Rhodes household growing up. And uh, I was one of three boys. And we had, obviously, with parents who were teachers, a big focus on doing our work. But I must confess, going through school, I never really worked too hard. I was more focused on my sport. And it was only at university that I started realizing that if I'm not prepared for something, I was more a case of going into the exam and hoping and praying that they would ask the questions that I had prepared for. And towards the end of my, my university, just before I got a degree, that was when I was prepared and had put the sport aside and was more focused on what I was doing in the actual classroom and in the studies, I was more relaxed going in. So preparation for university or for studies is exactly the same as preparing for a one day international on the cricket field. If you haven't done the work, you are going to be more anxious about can you then perform on the day. Now, my daughter, India, she's just started going to school and it really is amazing to see how excited she is to get ready for school each morning. And speaking of India, it is good to be back here and it's good to be back in the green and gold kit. I'm pretty good with numbers, having worked at a bank in South Africa with a Bachelor of Commerce degree. But if you ask me how many times I have visited India, I must confess, I will struggle to give you a number. So what I can say is this is the first time I'm coming to India as a cricket player and playing for a cause that's not only very serious, but one that I strongly advocate. Road accidents is nothing short of an epidemic. Safety, oh goodness, let me start again. Yeah. Road safety, the number of lives lost and families affected by road ac accidents is nothing short of an epidemic. The Un Academy Road Safety World Series will give us all cricketers common platform to raise awareness and make a positive change. Fitness, mental fitness, and believing in the unbelievable. Here are a couple of thoughts that I have on that. Um, I just want to be able to change the slide here, guys. Hold on up a second. Uh, that's not working for me. I'm going to need some assistance. Don't go anywhere. Bear with me. I'm a cricket player. I am no expert on this. Jesus, like. Please. Yeah. Okay, there you go. So in South Africa, it's always been a big part of my life, sport. And I think the, the real issue that we have is that how can you balance that? And I think with my parents both being teachers, they realized the importance of a healthy body and a healthy mind. So my sporting career was not just focused on cricket because in South Africa, we have very distinct winter and summer where we are allowed to play different, in fact, not just allowed, we encourage to play different sports. So cricket in the summer and tennis, and then hockey and football, soccer in the winter. And that, from that perspective, certainly was an all-round and well-rounded education. I also had the advantage of, as I said, my father was not only a principal, but he was also a cricket coach. So having your father as a coach sometimes gets a little bit much because there is no break. And especially as a headmaster and a principal, this is the way to do it. There was no discussion. But having a younger brother who was also keen on his cricket 
that was a massive asset because the two of us would spend a lot of time on a tennis court wherever we could find space working on our cricket playing together so from that point of view it was really awesome to have you know sean pollock was very similar he had a an older brother so in south africa we generally as a family did all of this stuff together so very grateful for that but the interesting thing from from my point of view around cricket was that there really was no fielding as such and and, and the amazing thing for me was that because I had a younger brother and because we had space, we lived in a very small town. Peter Maritzburg was where I went to school. I can't even say Peter Maritzburg. Peter Maritzburg was where I went to school. But I lived in a very small village, about a 30 minute drive out of Peter Maritzburg. And the village was called Hilton. And we actually had space in the backyard. We had space, we had a tennis court, and we also had grass. Now, I played enough cricket around India, knowing that even though there's green grass on the outfield, it's pretty much rock hard as well. But in South Africa, when you grow up, you're able to slide, you're able to dive. No matter what sport we were playing, we were always diving around in the backyard. So for me to be a fielder, when I got firstly selected to play for South Africa in 1992 at the Cricket World Cup, I was a batsman for sure. But as a fielder, it was certainly that was where I was noticed. And it wasn't a case of, hey, let me just, <clears throat> there's a gap in the market here and nobody's fielding. Let me do this and people will notice me. I was quite surprised that people were making such a fuss of my fielding because it really was something that I was doing as a kid in the backyard with my brothers. So really surprised at all the fuss of what was going on. Uh, with regards to fielding skills, I didn't have a fielding coach. I mean, now I'm, I'm a part of the IPL. I was nine seasons with, with Mumbai Indians and, and now I'm going to be the Kings Eleven fielding coach. Every team, whether it be international or even at a, at a franchise level, generally have two or three coaches and fielding is a good is a big part of what they do because we know how important fielding has become in the modern game but i didn't have a fielding coach so how did i improve my fielding skills well i was fortunate that in being a hockey player that sort of movement as a soccer player and as a tennis player as well all that lateral movement allowed me to move well in the field and also i think the key with anticipation i was often credited by the commentators that man, this John T. Rhodes has got great reflexes and great anticipation. And I didn't have better reflexes than anybody else because otherwise I would have been, you know, a much better batsman. It didn't help. As a batter, I was very average. So it just shows you I wasn't gifted with regards to reflex. But what I did have from an anticipation point of view was that because I loved to feel, I wanted every single ball to come to me. And that was the difference, I think, was that I was looking for the ball to come to me. And it wasn't a case of, hold on, you know, here's the board, let me react. I was in position for anything. And I think with regards to believing the unbelievable is that, as the slide says, that catch the ball looks like it's, it's gone past my hands. I actually caught it with one finger on each hand. So two fingers, one plus one is two. And the crazy thing is my whole philosophy when it comes to fielding was that if you don't go, you'll never know. So too often people are scared to fail so they don't want to go for the ball because they don't want the fielding coach to start writing in his book because now you've dropped the ball in the outfield so from that point of view i was more concerned about players who weren't going for the ball because that was my whole philosophy if you don't go you will never know so really really important that whatever you're doing as much as possible never fear failure just get out there and do the best that you can don't be comfortable in your comfort zone Get out there and see what you can achieve because you'll be amazed what you can. With regards to team and fielding, the amazing thing about when you're fielding, it never goes to your own score. So I was a batsman for a long time who wasn't contributing positively with the bat. I was averaging 35 when I ended my career for South Africa. But throughout that time, I was always a good fielder in test cricket and in one day cricket so a lot of people would say oh john T, don't worry you're averaging 30 with the bat but you're saving 20 in the field therefore that's 50 runs so you're fine but my first job certainly was to score runs with the bat which wasn't happening often enough but what was happening was that you would see how the performance of the other players if i put in a good fielding performance the performance of the other players was elevated because they were inspired and that's the key with you don't have to be a captain to be the leader you can be a leader in a team environment by just 
doing things for other people. Because if you think about it, if I was a fielder and I'd scored 30 runs when I had batted first, by the time I went onto the field and if I saved 20, my score, it stayed at 30. It didn't change at all. But Alan Donald, who was bowling, or Sean Pollock, the four runs that I dived at backward point and saved is deducted off their bowling figures. If I took a catch, it didn't go to my name, it went to their bowling figures. So I think from that point of view, it was that the reason why it was able to lift a teammate and, and, and contribute to the winning cause was the fact that I was now doing something for the benefit of the team and the benefit of my teammate, not for my benefit. And I think that really was an inspiration to the other players in the side. I had an incredible career that spanned over 11 years playing cricket for South Africa, all around the world. And uh, people keep asking me, which was my best catch or what was, you know, what, what is the performance that I was really excited about from a fielding perspective. And I think there's probably two instances that, that stand out for me. And the first one was 1992 Cricket World Cup. South Africa were playing against Pakistan and I ran out in Zimam ul -Haq. I wasn't backing myself to hit the stumps because we never practiced throwing down the wickets. I would practice catching a lot, but it was my first year of playing cricket for South Africa. So instead of throwing the ball at the stumps where we needed a wicket, I threw myself at the wickets and some guy took a great picture. And suddenly, literally, my career was launched by this great photograph in that 1992 Cricket World Cup of me running out in Zimam ul -Haq. He got run out many times in his career further <laughs> on because he, he wasn't the best between the wickets. But... I think from, from that point of view, what was a fielding performance that I individually made a difference was five wickets here, just down the road, literally, at the uh, CCI Cricket Club of India. And that was in a, a Hero Cup match against the West Indies, where I got five catches in a game, which I was told afterwards that it was a world record. So I had no idea that those world records even existed. So... Sorry, guys, I'm just... Can you change the slide? Yeah. I think also what is, is important is that in cricket these days, people talk about being all-rounders. And we've seen in T20 cricket, you can literally bowl 10 balls and you can hit 10 balls out the ground, score 30 runs, and you're considered to be an all-rounder. Where, from my perspective, as a sporting all-rounder, I was a fielder because of all the very different um, games that I'd played. As I said before, tennis cricket, hockey, and football. I think with regards to field hockey, my father was a rugby player, but I had a mild form of epilepsy as a youngster. So I wasn't allowed to play contact sports. Football was something, soccer was something that I could play, hockey was something I could play, and then obviously cricket and tennis. So I was very fortunate, amazingly enough, that I couldn't play rugby, because people would say, you know, aren't you sad that you can't play rugby? Rugby was a very popular sport in South Africa. And I was just, because my parents were both teachers, they encouraged me to play as many sports as possible, just not rugby. And what it did do, though, it allows you, when you know, when you know your weaknesses, um, it allows you then to focus on your strengths. And I think from that point of view, I never really had to then make a sudden choice between cricket and hockey because there was no country to play for in South Africa during the years of apartheid. So I would play six months of state cricket and six months of state hockey and study at university at the same time, which also goes back to my initial discussion on being prepared for exams. I often let my sport come in between my studies, but towards the end of my university, I realized the importance of finishing my degree, and that allowed me to, to maybe switch off slightly from cricket and hockey and focus more on my studies. But I'm very grateful for the fact that I was forced almost to play hockey instead of rugby, because as a fielder, if you think about it, running quickly over five meters was something that I was very good at. Running in a bent over position allowed me to swoop on the ball very quickly. And those were skills that I got from playing hockey. The reverse sweep was something that I was very confident in playing. And again, that was something from the hockey skills. Where in South Africa, we weren't, very, we weren't really renowned as risky players. We were way more technically correct on the English sort of method of coaching um, back in, in, the, in the 90s and um, early 2000s. And people who were sweeping the ball were often criticized in South Africa. So from my point of view, it was certainly the hockey skills that I had in the fielding and with regards to being good, being able to play the sweep and the reverse sweep comfortably, that was something that hockey allowed me to do. I was also at a stage almost in a position to go from playing in a Cricket World Cup in 1996 to playing in the Olympic hockey in 1996 in, uh, um, 
in Atlanta. But unfortunately, um, we were playing a cricket tournament and just before the Olympic trial, I pulled a hamstring and I had to withdraw from that. So that would have been a, a pretty special achievement, being able to play in a Cricket World Cup in 1996 and go later on and play in a in a hockey, um, the hockey Olympics. I don't think too many players have had that opportunity. So sadly, that wasn't to be. So having that sort of disappointment of not, it was also the end of my hockey career. I then had to focus on just playing cricket because suddenly we became really, really busy for eight or nine months of the year playing cricket. And uh, I was no longer able to compete at state level um, and then obviously be available for international hockey. So it wasn't a case of me choosing cricket over hockey. It was more a case of cricket was now dominating and we were playing, we were touring England over the winter, over the, the hockey season. So I was no longer available to play hockey. So I was probably a better hockey player at university and at school, thinking that one day I might play, if South Africa got back into international sport, one day I might be able to play hockey for my country. So I'm interesting how it turned out. So I think with, with regards to um, as I said before, I had epilepsy and uh, my parents, I'm grateful for the fact that they were teachers because they don't know that kids, if young children perceive somebody else in their peer group to be different, they can be a little bit nasty. So even though my parents were a bit anxious about me getting continually concussed and, and epilepsy was something that, that, that they were, you know, anxious about, but they didn't allow that to interfere with me growing up and doing participating in as much as possible. And I think what I tried to do was then encourage young kids in South Africa that once you know your limitations, you really can focus on your areas of strength. And that certainly was something that I was able to do, I think, in, in a very positive way, even though my epilepsy was very minor and it never affected me from a perspective where other than not playing rugby, I could pretty much go out and was encouraged to do as much as possible. So playing cricket for South Africa was really interesting. I mean, just to put things in perspective, though, I didn't have a country to play for when I grew up. There was no South Africa. Because of the apartheid regime, we had no country to play for, and rightly so. There were economic sanctions and sporting sanctions. So there was never a goal. When I got to play cricket for South Africa, there never was a, a dream come true. Because surprisingly, there was no country. There was not even a dream. But I just knew that if I wanted to play sport, and if I wanted to get a job one day that allowed me to play sport, that really was something that I had to focus on. And there were no shortcuts. And whatever you do, whatever you choose in, in life, there is no shortcut to success. It does require hard work. But from a belief point of view, you have to then get into a stage where you're loving that hard work. Because if you're enjoying what you're doing, it never becomes hard work. And that, the key, that was my passion. I loved playing cricket. I loved playing hockey. I loved the physical side of it, the physical requirements. I never thought today is going to be hard work. It's going to be fitness today. Oh, I don't want to go to practice. I just, every day I arrived on the cricket field, on the hockey field, I gave 100%. So that, for me, when I retired, was interesting because then I then worked in a bank in South Africa. So I retired from playing international cricket in 2003. So there was no international sport to play. There was no IPL. There was no need for a, a coach who was now just retired. Coach, most of the staff still were only one or two, most national teams. So I then worked for Standard Bank in South Africa with my Bachelor of Commerce degree. And I think from, from that perspective, the same attitude that I had in the cricket field, I took into the corporate environment because I wanted to learn every day. With cricket, playing cricket for South Africa for 11 years, we were learning every single day. And that same attitude I took into the banking environment where I was having to learn about policies and products and banking procedures, people kept saying, how on earth do you get into a bank? Isn't that boring? Well, the time that I spent there was really enjoyable because every single day I was learning something new, which is very important. And I think that that same attitude certainly allowed me. And then from a team perspective, you know, it's also about not just what am I doing, but what can I do for other people in the office around me? Getting cups of coffee and cups of tea, I was like being 12th man in the banking environment. So yeah, pretty cool for me to be able to do that. So fitness, diet, 
If you think about it, fitness and diet, everyone gets a little bit nervous. And fortunately, because if you talk about fitness, you talk about a fitness regime. I mean, it sounds terrible. A diet, how many people have been able to maintain and stay on a diet? And I think from my point of view, which is why I've embraced since I've stopped playing, things like surfing, mountain biking, yoga, because all of that is exercise, but it's actually a lifestyle adaption. So my wife and I, as a family, we get out with young children. Um, as I said, I grew up playing sports. So we were fit young kids because we didn't have time. And I know you're going to say there was no technology. There was no iPad or screen to sit and play on. I mean, now in South Africa, we don't actually have a television at home in our family. So we encourage our children to get outside and play. We as a family, my wife and I do yoga together, but we all go down to the beach. We spend time at the beach in the ocean just doing, making lifestyle adjustments that keep us healthy. So from that point of view, I don't think we were ever involved with a diet or a training regime. I think now there is a lot of fitness that's specific towards, from a cricketing point of view, you'll see fast bowlers will do specific exercises, batsmen will do something slightly different, and it has become very scientific. But if you can incorporate yoga into that, as opposed to taking it over, it's a great balance from that perspective. As I said, I was never on a diet, so I didn't have to worry about Because when you're on a diet, again, it's about setting goals. The same thing with a training regime. Here's your end goal. What happens if you don't get there? What if, if you have a bad day and you suddenly, you have a cheeseburger or if you have a, you know, you have a, whatever the, the fizzy drink is that you have, do you now are devastated? And a lot of times if people stumble at once, that's it. They pack away their gym clothes and they, just decide that this diet is not for them. And they actually, if anything, they end up in a worse situation. So that's why for me, it was more about a lifestyle adaption. Because I can walk up the stairs instead of taking the elevator. I can say no to the cookie. I mean, what is it here in India? Every time you have a cup of tea, I've got a cup of tea right here, but there is no biscuit. Every time you have a cup of tea, here, there's always two biscuits you have. Don't eat the cookie. So it's very small things. When You know, I walk around with, 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 uh, with the team, we get a we always fly around India during the IPL, and you get a wheelie bag. Got rucksack, most of the guys pull it. I'll put it on my back and I'll carry it. It's an extra seven kgs when I'm walking. If the escalator's going down, I'll take the stairs. Small things that make you a healthier. So fitness is not about biceps and six pack. Don't believe the Bollywood that you see, it's not fitness. Wellness is what you should be striving for because wellness is what allows you to prepare as a student, and I know what you guys are going through. There's a lot of hard work that you are having to put in, not just a couple of hours of practice like some of us do. It's a lot of, from my perspective, it's a lifestyle change that has made the difference because that is sustainable. I know the difference between do I need a cookie or not? Food for me is nutrition. So yes, I do eat things that are not on the diet plan. I'm not on a plan. I don't have to worry about I've eaten too many calories today or by lunchtime, I can't eat anything for the rest of the day. I know what my body requires from a nutrition point of view. And if I'm eating something, is it medicine? Because nutrition is, should be medicine for your system. Or is it something that's going to upset my system for the next couple of weeks or next day or two? So I think from that point of view, it really is important that it becomes a part of your lifestyle. It's, it's quite amazing now with this, uh, with this series now, I've just bumped into Herschel Gibbs. I chat to him on WhatsApp often and he was a real character in the south african team and nothing has changed the i think we we also we old men who uh for a long time we were men but we were really boys because if you're with a team for eight or nine months of the year you, you can you can imagine i mean we all traveling around the world playing as hard as we can and um, just enjoying each other's company so it's, it's really interesting i sent my wife a message yesterday just saying I've hooked up with these guys who I haven't seen some of them for six or seven years. It was like we hadn't we hadn't missed a day. It was like just being back on tour. So really special to have this opportunity, not only to play for a good cause, but also to hook up with players who I haven't seen for quite a long time. So, as I said, the fitness is not a necessity. It is a choice. Because fitness, too often that perception is, I have to go to the gym or I have to run a marathon. We're not all built, and that's me, including me, built to run a marathon. I like to swim, and that's why surfing in the ocean for us is really, really important because it allows me to go and exercise, but actually still having fun. 
So with regards to that, um, I took up yoga. My wife's actually a yoga teacher. And the only time I would come to the gym was when I was working in the IPL, spending two months of the year in a hotel. Couldn't get into the ocean. And that was the only time I really got into the gym. But from this perspective, I have found with yoga, it was the amazing thing about yoga. And I'm really looking hard as a fielding coach to try and encourage, especially young Indian players, to do yoga. Because yo what yoga teaches you is that me for to hit hard or to throw hard, power actually comes from the ground up. If you utilize your entire body and not just the major muscle groups, you have way more timing and way more power. So what the gym does is actually it exercises one major muscle. Yoga will exercise an entire group of muscles. And as I said earlier, the perception of fitness is biceps and, and six pack. Core strength is again, not about six pack. Core strength is about a lot of the entire group of muscles working together. And that's one thing that yoga teaches you to do. It teaches you to hold a position in asana for quite a long time, a period of time that requires all your body to work together. So that I think is a key. It's not just the Kyron Pollards or the IPL or the Chris Gales who are big hitters and great fielders. Smaller guys like myself can still contribute if we know how to utilize our strength. And that comes from the ground up. And yoga certainly is a great grounding um, place, whether it be physically and mentally. So very important for me, yoga really is a part of me, what I want to do. So, guys, I'm not leaving you just yet. I am here to field some of your questions that you've sent in. So let's crack it. The first question comes from Manish. His question is, how do we focus on mental health when multiple problems surround us at once? You know, it's a bit like playing cricket. You've only got one ball to hit, but you've got five different options. So I think the key there is that with regards to how do you focus on mental health is that you just have to keep things simple. Work for us, I'm, I'm very much a, pro a process driven person as opposed to a result or outcome driven coach. Because as a cricket player, I made mistakes. I dropped the ball. I didn't score runs, but I had never felt that I went into a game not being prepared, whether for the ball coming in, in, in the outfield or the ball coming from the bowler. So mental health, take pressure off yourself. Just know that you have put in the work. Be prepared for whatever comes. Don't keep focusing on what can I do this or can I do that? Just focus on one thing at a time. There's a lot going on, especially as a student. I know there's going to be a lot going on, but just focus on one thing, overcome it and move on to the next one. Okay. Hopefully that will help Manish. Um, the next question. Double sing advocate. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. How do we push our bars for scheduled fitness routine when we have to spend 12 to 14 hours of studying daily? Understand again, that's why I talk about it's not a fitness regime or routine. If you can adapt and in your studies, there will be a time where you have to, like I said, I eventually had to focus more on my studies than on my sport, but I still had a healthy, a very healthy body with regards to unknown for me to, to be able to control, um, spending hours and hours in a day studying, I still had to be healthy. So I didn't just neglect anything every day. The key there, what you have to do is then adapt in your lifestyle. Get up, walk around. That will help. Do some yoga. That really will help. So from that point of view, you don't have to go to the gym. You don't have to spend an hour running outside or an hour walking. Ten minutes of just refreshing the blood. Um, there are many yoga positions where you inverted and fresh blood then flows to the brain. I think that is really, really important. Don't skip out your fitness routine. Just adapt it to your study hours. It really is important to keep maintaining that. No matter how many hours you study, make sure after 55 minutes, stand up, walk around, sit down. Include five minutes of walking, breathing, standing up, sitting down, inversions in your hour of study. Break it down into achievable goals. Don't just suddenly three hours later, man, I've been sitting here for three hours studying and you will be exhausted. Break it down. Make those goals achievable, but include five minutes breathing, yoga, walking, squat at the desk. No issue. Just get the blood flowing. Okay. 
important. So, next question. Arnav Singh, how to have a fresh mind for study every day? Okay, so fresh mind does require exercise for sure. But again, I think it's talking, we we're spending time in the process. Because for us, I set myself goals of practice. And if I've achieved them, I'm excited about going back tomorrow and seeing what else can I do. So break your day down into small achievable goals and then grow it again tomorrow. To start afresh every day is really tough. You have to include some form of exercise. But I think achieve the goals on day one, get them done, and then move on to the next day. Okay, so break each day up into a goal. Don't think it's a whole week of studies. One day at a time. Okay, break it down into goals. Okay, the next question from Alok Kumar. For students, it becomes very difficult to balance time between studies and exercise, especially around exams. What would, we, what would you suggest we do? Again, I'm going to keep repeating myself. You can include exercise in your study routine. But the best thing, phone some friends, bring a football, bring a gully cricket, play soccer, kick a ball around, shoot some hoops. Just get outside in the street. It doesn't have to be on a field. Not everybody has space like I grew up with. So just get outside, have a break. Include it in your studies that for every hour that you study, five to 10 minutes, it needs to be exercise. And that exercise can just be walking with a couple of friends down the road, back up, throwing a tennis ball, hitting a shuttlecock, get some badminton, play that in the street. Don't sit at your desk for three hours and think you've done an amazing thing because it is a bit of a marathon. Okay, none of us here are sprinters. If you're working that hard, 10 to 12, 12 to 14 hours in a day around your exams, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Okay, sprinters are exhausted. Get out, break yourself, break those um, study hours up, include some sort of exercise. Okay, I am repeating myself, but thanks for the question. It is a good one. I had the same issue when I was a student, that's for sure. Nishant wants to know, during exams, we study all day and night, and that affects our body. Is there any quick tip on how we can stay fighting fit during this time? Nishant, I spoke about it earlier. I'm not on a diet. Um, I'm not on a training regime. But I know nutrition is really important. As much as possible, eat raw if you can. Juice it. It's a great way. Get members of your family to help you out. If you can, get a juicer, raw veg, juice it. It is Nutrition is so important. It's fuel. Don't just snack on a chocolate or think, okay, you need a sugar rush. Don't take the easy option. Okay. Your studies are an important part of where you go next in your life. So for me, it's like having net session to be able to be picked for South Africa. I have to prepare well. And it's not just having a good net session. I had to do my exercise. I had to be fit. And I certainly had to be that fitness also was important from a nutrition point of view. So if you can, get juice. Juice vegetables. Okay, it's a great way from a nutrition point of view. In India, there's Ayurveda medicine. I mean, there's... The crazy thing for me is that yoga has been here for a thousand years and so has Ayurveda. And in India, we kind of look to the West. Oh, that comes from the US, comes from Europe. It's better. Let's do this and let's do that. It's not. It's right here. Okay. Ayurveda herbs, they certainly are incredible. From a performance enhancing point of view, I'm trying to introduce that into cricket, into the coaching, with regards to recovery and endurance. Because it's been here for a thousand years. Okay. It means it's... It's got real credibility. Okay, I hope that's answered your question. All right, the next one. How do you think technology ah, has affected today's fitness ratio? I don't have a watch, guys. I took my watch off. I'm a bit embarrassed. It's, it's the first watch that I was ever given as a cricket player. We were sponsored in, in, in 1990, 1994. It was a watch that was a diver's watch. And I've changed the strap. I don't know how many times I've changed the battery. But it doesn't give the heart rate. It doesn't give anything about how I slept. So I'm a bit old school. I'm not that old, but I am a bit old school. Because my fitness is not about keeping up to this or that or achieving that. So I think the, the problem with, with regards to technology, you can use it. But also, it's, it's a bit of an easy way out. Because you follow trends. And uh, you know what it's like with trends. Something works for you. You take it. And for the next two months, you hit that hard. And then suddenly, it's not working or you have a bad week. And you neglect it. So with regards to technology, I'm all for it. It's coming to cricket. I love the way that technology has been introduced. So I think from, from that point of view, don't be scared to use it. But don't just use it to follow trends. Use it to maximize your body, what your body requires. 
Okay, so use it as an aid, as, a po as opposed to something that you, you know is worked for somebody else, and you want to follow exactly what they've done. Use it specifically for your own benefit. Okay, I like technology. I think it's, um, it is important. And, and as I say, I would, I would rather go, okay, the hard ECG that you can get on your watch, um, what can I use from a nutrition and from an Ayurveda point of view? How can I make sure that I am fighting fit and 100% ready to go? Okay, so use technology, but also don't just use it as a trend or as a fad. Make sure it's a, it's a big part of what you're doing that allows you to achieve your goals in the long term. Okay, it must be sustainable. All right. Let me see what else we got here. Um, that was from, oh, sorry, Anurag, thanks for that question. How do we reduce mental stress with physical exercise? Okay, well, again, mental stress, you sit still. So you study for long hours, you're sitting at the same desk, so everything up here, your shoulders, your neck, it gets stiff. You need blood flow. I think for me to do yoga for five minutes, just off the chair, on the floor, keep your mat rolled up next to you. 55 minutes of study, do yoga. Inversions, fresh blood, um, really good. Just warrior position. From that point of view, it requires a whole body to be in focus, all the muscle groups to be working. But yoga, get the blood flowing, sit down. Include the five minutes in your study hour. So your study hour is 55 minutes of doing work, five minutes of movement and preferably with yoga. Okay. Thanks, Elsu. Okay. Aniket Singh. He has a question. There are so many people with physical challenges who have been immensely successful in life. In that case, do you think physical fitness, fitness is vital for being successful? Well, if you're a 100 meter sprinter, you got to be fit, that's for sure. If you're a marathon runner, you have to be fit. But I think fitness is the, what is the perception of fitness? And again, my concern in India is that it's Bollywood biceps and six pack. Okay, that is not fitness. For me, wellness is something that stems from your lifestyle. And that will provide the nutrition, the flexibility, the strength to achieve what you want to achieve. It's not working out an hour a day. Because you're right, there are so many people who are differently abled, who have been incredible successes in their field. But you'll find as well that there are many people who have slight disabilities, as I said with someone with epilepsy, when you know your limitations, you then focus on your areas of strength. Too often there, we all think we can, you know, we can be a total all-rounder, we can do everything. You know, I was a tennis player, soccer player, cricket and hockey. There eventually came a time where I had to streamline that to choosing hockey and cricket. Okay, and then cricket. So from that point of view, you want to be able to focus. And yes, physical fitness is not what's going to help you achieve your goals. Being disciplined in your lifestyle means that you will have discipline in your studies and you'll have discipline in a work environment. And that's what people are looking for. Yeah, you've got to be a team player. You have to be able to think out the box and be creative, sure. But a lot of it stems from discipline. And that was something that my father as a principal drummed into us boys with a big stick early on as a, as a youngster in our house. So discipline from that perspective in your lifestyle certainly makes a massive difference don't have to be the guy pushing the big weights in the gym. Okay, hope that's answered your question. Abhidesh, you are a player, he asks, who never stopped taking risks. How did you keep ignoring the risk factor and keeping yourself motivated always? Well, I didn't realize the risk, firstly, of diving into the stumps in Australia in 1992 because people were, were worried that, that I impale myself in the wickets. And uh, as I said earlier, I wasn't scared of failure. So as, as a coach, I would rather go for the ball and drop it. I want to see players go for the ball and drop it. So yes, taking risk these days is doing something you're uncomfortable doing or not in your perceived strength because none of us like to fail. We all have egos. So that's a risk. You know, people ask me, what is it like facing someone like a Brett Lee or Shob Akhtar, guys who are bowling nearly 100 miles an hour? Can you face these guys physically and, and not be intimidated? So, you know, the biggest risk that I faced was facing Murali and Shane Warne because they would blow your, I mean, they would damage your ego. And that's the biggest damage anyone can endure. So taking risk is very difficult for all of us because none of us like to fail. Nobody likes to fail. 
But if you play and you study and you perform in the areas where you're only strong and you're not prepared to use those mistakes that you make as stepping stones to greater things, how do you know what you can achieve? That is my philosophy. You don't go for the ball, you'll never know. Go for it. If you drop the ball, if there's a technical deficiency, I'll watch the replay and then we'll work on it. But if the player has gone for it, he's given 100%. I've actually got goosebumps now thinking of some of the, the great catches the guys have taken. Not me. The players that I've worked with. I'm more busy taking notes if they don't go for the ball. Because they haven't been prepared to take the risk. And I need to ask them, were they not ready for the ball? Or they worry about upsetting the coach that if they go for the ball and, and they drop it, then the team owner and the fielding coach are going to come hard at them. Okay, be prepared to take risk. If you make a mistake, learn from those mistakes and grow. If we keep making the same mistake day after day after day, thinking we'll get a different result, yeah, we need to change our thinking. But be prepared to take risks. If you fail, use those as stepping stones, not stumbling blocks. Okay, take risks. Be prepared. All right, thank you. Good question. Moving on from Divya. How do you... How do we free our mind of all negative thoughts and stay motivated? Okay, so as a cricket player, up and down, especially a batsman. I mean, a bowler, you can bowl a bad ball. Next ball, you can get the guy out. You can recover the over. You can pull it back. As a batsman, you get out, see you later. You sit on the side, and there's nothing worse than watching other people bat, score runs, your teammates. Even though the team's doing well, your job is to be there scoring runs. You get one chance. And hey, it might not be a bad delivery. Sometimes it's a bad mistake or decision from the umpire or great ball. Bowlers are allowed to bowl a good delivery and get you out. So how do I free my mind? How did I free my mind as a player from negative thoughts? Process. You work on my focus was the process, not the end result. If I know that I have given 100% in the practice, not the day of the game, the day before, the day before and the day before that. So building up to the match day. Have I done everything 100% correct or as much as possible? I've left nothing to chance. If my preparation is 100%, I'm not worried about, obviously, I want to score runs. Obviously, I want to take the catches. But I can't be focused totally on the outcome. What was the process? That motivated me. How can I get better at practice? Another lesson my father taught me. John, you got to, people will tell you throughout your career, practice makes perfect. He said, no. That's half the story. It's perfect practice that makes perfect. So practice like you're playing in a match. Prepare like you're in the exam. Put yourself under pressure because in the exam, you're going to be under pressure. Don't just study. I've clocked in 14 hours. Wow, that was a good day. How have you studied? It's the process. Okay, so those negative thoughts, if you've done the process 100%, no negative thoughts. It's not the outcome we're focusing on. Okay, good question, Divya. Thank you. Oh, I think I'm almost done, guys. Time has been racing. Um, I'm just looking around here. Have I left something out? Okay, so I really hope you guys have had an enjoyable session. And as closing words, all I can say, hard work and healthy habits. Hard work, it's a balance, and healthy habits can help you crack it. Thank you.